Welcome, everybody, uh, to a brand new episode here of the Geek Buddies. <gasps> hey! hey. <sighs> <laughs> we are back at it with our Friday episode here. Uh, thanks to everybody who watched a few days ago. We talked about the Oscars. If you haven't watched our breakdown of the Oscars, it is up on the channel now. But we are back with our main show today. And our show is going to be a little bit different today. We're going to talk about a lot of topics, but we're essentially going to split the show up into two sections. We're going to lead with all the Star Wars news in one section, take a break, and then we're going to go into all the Marvel stuff in the second section. So we hope you hang out with us and enjoy our conversation conversations as we jump into all of that here on the geek buddies but let's introduce ourselves for any of you who may be uh first time watchers of the show i am the outlaw john roca writer producer and host here on the geek buddies i am michael vogel writer and producer of animated tv shows and movies and currently still recovering from going to the glad awards last night and this is shannon mcclung i'm a television actor and an animation writer where you can see some of our current work right now on the glad award nominated strawberry shortcake barry in the big city season three is on youtube every weekend and seasons one and two are on netflix yeah we should talk about it because it's certainly our fans uh, when you announced this last week michael were a very uh, congratulatory to you and to shannon and to everybody involved in the strawberry shortcake team so tell us last night was the event you wore a fantastic white suit you looked great what was the experience like? Did you all win? And what can you say about the GLAAD Awards? We did not win. Um, oh. We did hang out with a lot of fun people. Uh, we were okay. Our table was right next to the uh, Transformers table from Nickelodeon. And yeah. you know, they were nominated as well. So hanging out, the Strawberry Shortcake team and the Transformers team all hanging out together at the GLAAD Awards. And it was a really fun event. Um, you know, awesome to see so many people coming together to support the community. Mm. Uh, Oprah Winfrey was honored. And just see, being in the same room with Oprah is Pretty cool. Um, and just had a really, really nice time. So it was fun. Uh, there was a two hour cocktail party followed by the nice. three hour award show followed by the two hour after party. So that's a lot of hours of drinking and martinis. <laughs> um, but no, so we either, even though we did not win, um, nor did the Transformers team, we all decided it was really cool that uh, Transformers and Strawberry Shortcake got to hang with the cast of Yellow Jackets and the cast of Ted Lasso and the cast of Drag Race and uh, have a really fun, gay old time. Wow. Is there a Transformers Strawberry Shortcake crossover being talked mm -hmm. about in any way, shape, or form? Or no? Mm -hmm. Is that not How a possibility? How does that work? Optimus? Optimus? Perry? Uh, no, Optimus really Pine? There it oh. is. See, that's why, by the way, that's why we keep Shannon around. Yeah. <laughs> nice stuff nice stuff Crumbly, uh, so well congratulations to you both for being a part of a glad uh, nominated show and of course uh, i'm sorry that you guys lost but it sounds like it was a great time there michael so great to hear from you all and it's fantastic you guys want to check out strawberry shortcake as shannon said it's all available there on netflix have fun they're four minute episodes you can tear through a season in like a uh, two hours or something like that so come on get on it which ball. which johnny has done Yes, many, many times. It's a great show. A lot of voiceover <laughs> work. I mean, somehow I didn't get called in to voice anything. But yeah, it's great voiceover work all over that show. Fantastic stuff. Uh, so yeah, definitely you guys should check it out. Great. We're animation. gonna bring you back for the crossover and you can voice Egatron. Oh, <sighs> uh, there he is. He's yeah, he's warming up, had... folks. He's warming up, folks. The, this is not the last one of these they're gonna get in this hour long episode. I just had a double egg bagel. I love it. That's no, perfect. <laughs> uh, anyway, let's uh, let's get into things here. And the first place we're gonna go, of course, uh, is Patty Jenkins, and uh, that's the the big conversation that's been going on here over the last few days. Patty Jenkins, uh, supposedly, supposedly, last we checked, when last we saw Patty Jenkins and Star Wars, they had reportedly parted ways um, because she wanted to work on the now defunct. Wonder Woman 3, but recently on a podcast this week with Ben Bankowitz over there on the Talking Pictures podcast, which is on the TCM slash Max podcast network, she mentioned that she is back on to doing Rogue Squadron in some fashion. She said, so when I left Star Wars to do Wonder Woman 3, I thought maybe I'll come back to Star Wars after Wonder Woman 3. So we did a deal for that to happen, started a deal, but I thought I was doing Wonder Woman. 
When that went away, Lucasfilm and I were like, oh, we got to finish this deal. We finished the deal right as the strike was happening. So I now owe a draft of Star Wars. And so we will see what happens there. You know, like, who knows? It's hard. They have a jo- hard job in front of them of what's the first movie they're going to do. It's been announced. Mandalorian, Grogu, catch up there, uh, Jenkins. They have other directors who have been working. But I am now, you know, I'm back on doing Road Squadron. And we'll see what happens we need to develop, you know, get it to where we are both super happy with it. So, Michael, this is a lot of talk for someone that was not officially announced by Lucasfilm as coming back to the project. Your overall thoughts on these comments here from uh, Patty Jenkins to Ben Mankiewicz. I mean, the fact that she owes them a script is pretty far down on the green light totem pole <laughs> yeah tell us as mike for those you may know michael has Thanks. is an executive has been a showrunner he's been in the halls of power in this thing so yes please explain this michael well so like if they made a deal uh you know that they were gonna develop a script with patty jenkins for rogue squadron and they seemed pretty excited about it when they filmed her in front of an airplane you know what yeah in what the video feels like 35 years ago um <laughs> and I'm sure that they're like, well, we made this deal. She might as well write the script. Maybe it'll be great. Like, who knows? Right. Um, but it does start to feel a little bit like, I mean, look, I'm look. Let, let her write that script. Let's see what's going on. If it's a great script and she wants to make a great Star Wars movie, all power to her. It right. does seem to feel like Lucasfilm, even though they came out with the, you know, they came out with this big announcement. They're like. We're doing the Ray Skywalker movie. We're doing the Origin of the Jedi movie. Yeah. Deloney's going to wrap everything up. That's what we're doing. And it was like, okay, that is still some problems with that plan, potentially, but right. that's a plan. And then they're like, P.S., we're also doing Mandalorian and Grogu. Okay, so that's four, and the Mandalorian and Grogu is tied to the Filoni one, maybe, but okay, yeah. cool. And then Patty Jenkins rolls up and said, by the way, I'm still writing this Rogue Squadron. And you're just like, <laughs> oh, Star Wars, like, Lucas, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing? Um, and, like, to be clear, to be fair to Lucasfilm, like, they didn't announce this. They didn't come out and say, by the way, Rogue Squadron's back on. It's right. Patty Jenkins trying to make some news for Patty Jenkins. But it does sort of lead to a bigger concern. I mean, as we're talking about Star Wars for this first chunk of the hour, you know, like, yeah. like I'm, I'm hearing rumors. And, I mean, again, rumors only. But, like, I'm hearing rumors that the Ray movie is not in great shape. Yeah. Um, and that they don't really... No, uh, Shannon and I were talking about this the other day, particularly Mm -hmm. in the shadow of Dune 2 coming out and just being such a massive hit both uh, with with audiences, with critics, like box office. And one of the reasons I think it works so well is like the movie has a very clear point of view. It's saying some very specific things. And I think when George Lucas made the original trilogy, he wanted to talk about some specific things. And even when George Lucas made the prequels as problematic as some of us feel some of the prequels are from a sure. production standpoint, from a script standpoint, sure. he was telling a very specific story. Star Wars feels like it's lost a little bit of what its story is. Mm. It feels like we're, we, we, they love to fill in the gaps, right? That's a safe space. It's like, okay, well we know that Palpatine returned cause we said that. So let's, let's, let's spend a lot of time talking about cloning between these movies, but it doesn't feel like they really know where they're going. And so Patty Jenkins writing a script and throwing that news out there onto the pile feels like one more uh, notch in the what the fuck are you doing Lucasfilm belt. Yeah, uh, Shannon, you look at this. She's t- talking out loud about her situation there, Rogue Squadron. She's ta- she's taking ownership of the script. She's kind of saying like, hey, we got to get this done. We got to get this done. I'm in with Disney and Lucasfilm because we got to get this done. But Matthew Robinson is the credited uh, writer on the script. So w- she's doing a pass and she was supposed to be the director on this thing. Is this her going into business for herself? a little bit of overbranding or maybe trying to get herself back into people's uh, minds or people into people's mouths because she hasn't done anything and she's taken some hits now from 1984 to Wonder Woman 3 being scrapped to her being kicked off Rogue Squadron. Like, why would you do something like this? You could have easily submitted the pass and not done something and not said a word about it, collected your paycheck and rolled on. Is this her trying to get herself back into the mouths of people in Hollywood? I mean, it, it's it's a very common thing. I imagine in all industries, but since we work in the entertainment industry, yeah. that's one I'm referencing, um, people want to, companies want to hire people who are working. 
because if you are currently employed, that ge- that gives companies like, oh, they're doing something right because you are employed in this highly competitive industry. Yeah. And, you know, the the thing with, when they put that video out, there was an expectation given to the fans that this was this project was maybe a little further along than it actually was. Mm-hmm. And then when she left, I mean, I, I think that's the thing, even like D.C., has done this um uh you announce a movie you don't necessarily say oh by the way that movie's dead like you don't always make an announcement like when dc unleashed that first um torrent of like we're gonna do the green lantern core and then then the cyborg movie is coming and granted they didn't they didn't um announce any creatives that were attached to it they just say hey this is coming out uh uh, on this date um they never came back and like, oh, by the way, that's dead. Um, so the fact that Patty Jenkins, like this was announced, it was not as far along as far along down the road as as it seemed like it probably was. For her to come back and, and finish the script, I think Vogel's right. Like, you know, we we had a deal for you to do this. Go ahead and do it. And uh, I, I feel like if the project were in really good shape, Disney doesn't necessarily want you talking about it. Like, like yeah. let's, they want to take, they want to own that narrative. They want to take control of like, Hey, this is, this is who is involved. This is when it's coming out. So I do <laughs> think what you, what you mentioned, John, it probably does have some credibility. Like the idea that she's like, Oh, by the way, yeah, I, I am doing this now. Like she's the one who was kind of talking yeah. about it. I'm mean, like, yeah. yeah, you, you want it. You want to bang the drum for your own career. So yeah. wait, hold on. I'm just trying to make sure I, I want to get my, um, <clears throat> Star Wars Graveyard, correct. So <laughs> Benioff and Weiss yes. came and went. Yes. Yeah. Ryan Johnson came and went. Oh, went? Uh, went it's, still ha- it's still supposedly still happening. Taika Waititi is apparently every night before he goes to bed writing two or three lines in his Star Wars script that he's yes. going to turn in one day. In between pictures with Rita Ora, yes. Uh, <laughs> Patty <laughs> Jenkins. Damon Lindelhoff came and went. Damon Lindelhoff came in and then went Damon and left went. and was like, guys, this was rough. Right. Is there anyone else that I'm missing? Aside yeah, from Kevin, the people that are attached to the actual movies that we know are happening. Kevin Feige. Kevin, Kevin Feige Kevin Star Feige. Wars movie that he was going to produce. And is Sean Levy, is he the yeah. Ray movie? Or is that, a a different, movie. is that another one? He is. He's writing a Ray movie. Okay. A, mo- a Ray movie or the Ray movie? No, not the Ray movie. A Ray movie. From what I know, from what I understand... He is writing a Ray movie, and uh, Stephen Knight is writing a separate Ray movie that uh, Charmino Bay Chinoy is directing. The Ray yeah. movie. The He's Ray the movie. Ray. Like That's the Ray movie. Yeah. A-, a Ray movie? Yes, the a Ray, Ray, Ray movie. movie. <laughs> By the way, Horowitz, Josh Horowitz on his Happy, Sad, Confused podcast, he kind of asked Daisy about these rumors about a Ray movie that was being done where she is old and that Helen Mirren was going to play Ray as an older Ray. And this is, Daisy said it was the first she'd heard of it, but that is the rumored Sean Levy approach is that this is an older Ray um, looking back on her life. And so the story is being told through flashback and, and going back to Helen Mirren playing Ray back and forth. So there's a lot of rumors about it uh, going on and, Michael, like you, I've also heard from a couple of sort pretty tapped in sources who say that it's a bit of a mess there, the Ray movie. So, it, and it would suck, man. If that thing goes down, all the anti woke people are going to fucking lose their mind. Yeah. We were right. We were right. So, you see, and it just is going to waste a lot of fucking toxic or spill a lot of toxic energy back into the Star Wars fandom, which would suck. I mean, but I mean, yeah, good. Well, just, and to be clear, I mean, of all of the Star Wars projects, mm. I'm rooting for the Ray movie the most. Sure. Because it's the thing that gets Star Wars out of where Star Wars is now. Like, yeah. I love yeah. Ahsoka as a character. The Ahsoka series, little hit and miss for me. But like in general, yeah. Star Wars is like a storytelling traffic jam right now. Right. Like they are like, hey, we have this, we have some space between um Revenge of the Sith and and uh, and and A New Hope. 
we filled most of that space, but we still have a couple more stories to tell. We've yep. got these 30 years between Jedi and Force Awakens, so we can do a bunch of stuff there because those movies exist and we know we have to link up to that stuff. Yeah. But it's all just filling in gaps. It's all just sort of running around. We get to like, you know, we get to a, like we're going to talk about Bad Batch, but like mm. a lot of Bad Batch season 3 is a lot of Ahsoka season 1, which is, "Hey guys, let's spend a lot of time getting off this planet. Now we got to get back to this planet." No, no, we got to get to this planet. Okay, now we're stuck. We got to get off the planet. It's just like there's a lot of moving pieces, but it doesn't feel like the story's moving. And Ray is the one thing that is set after mm. everything. It's after yeah. Rise of Skywalker. It's after all of that. It's it's whatever it does can define what's yeah. next for Star Wars. And I think that's why it's in kind of a mess because I don't think anyone at Lucasfilm is confident enough to to put a stake in the ground and say this is what star wars is going to be moving forward i think that's a great point it's supposed to set the table right shannon to kind of let us go from there to go, move forward what we're going to do this is what the new trilogy or the new uh universe is going to be now um and it seems yeah i, see, I, I sense the same thing that michael says is that what do you think that uh no one's willing to make a strong decision and go no this is what we're doing fuck everything else this is the way we're going if they hate it they hate it but this is the way we're going and it seems like they're doing what J.J. did in Rise of Skywalker. Let's try to satisfy everybody so that nobody hates us. And that's never going to work. Yeah, I mean, and, and again, this is this is another Hollywood thing. Uh, yeah. No one wants to be the one to say yes. <laughs> because <laughs> if you are the first one but who says yes, <laughs> if you're the first domino, if it goes south, <laughs> then you are you yeah. are the one that, that a lot of the blame is going to get hung up on. Now, yeah. once someone has said yes, everyone can chime in and be like, yep, it was great. It was great. It was great. If it's if it's a success then you can be like, hey, I was part of that chorus that said this was, I was I was one of the ones that said Home Alone was going to be a hit. Um, and if it's no, <laughs> then like, well, I wasn't the first, I didn't, I didn't approve this. Yep. Yeah. I didn't touch like, it. I'm, I'm, I was, I was trying to be a good team player. I had my reservations, but I was getting on, I was getting on team Star Wars. This is what I wanted to do. So yeah. until someone does make that decision and ultimately it's it, it's going to be Kathleen Kennedy who, who says yeah. yay or nay. And, you know, her, her, you know, first at bat, being the solo producer um, with the tril the sequel trilogy, yeah, yeah. It didn't turn out well. And I mean, you know, and it was even though it, they made a lot of money, um, it kind of uh, hobbled the brand a little bit, especially by the end. So I think she's probably reticent to say, "Yep, this is the direction we're going." Yeah. Well, yeah. and look, and to be fair, because and Shannon, Shannon, and I talked about this recently when we were at Disneyland, like hmm. the new trilogy. We already have planned a Geek Buddies day. I thought I was safe to bring it up. We have planned a day when the three of us are going. I don't um, know who said that. I'm sorry. <laughs> you, you texted us lots of pictures of the Disney ticket webpage and said, am I doing this right? Like, you know what? The whole thing. There's no need to bring up my copy. Go ahead. Yes. Um, no, but like, look, we when we were at Galaxy's Edge, like, I, I love the fact there is a generation of kids that they're growing up on Force Awakens, mm. uh, Last Jedi, and sure. Rise of Skywalker. And yeah. they will like it, even Rise of Skywalker, more than we do. And that, and that is great, and I'm glad that like Ray and Poe and Finn and Kylo Ren and BB-8 and all of them have, have are a part of the Star Wars universe. But just to be fair, like J.J. Abrams, he got he basically got to do the do-over, like Force yeah, Awakens, and yeah, like yeah. as much as like a lot of us really enjoy watching Force Awakens, it is a do-over. Like yeah. the Resistance is the Rebellion, the First Order is the Empire. Like everything is sort of a star killer base is a bigger death star like yeah. they just did a new hope over again and they don't and we all accepted it at the time because we were so excited for star wars to be back they can't do that again yeah no they can't right. go now we have galaxy killer station <laughs> and have a giant galaxy that 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 uses kyber crystals to knock over over other galaxies uh you know like they, they, you can't right. just keep doing that so they are at a crossroads where it's like Okay, so what's next? Yeah, that's what I feel like, and and, and we'll move on to the next subject because we already spent twenty minutes on this particular topic. But uh, I mean, uh, this particular story. Um, I feel, and I compared this the other day when I was on the hot mic talking about it with Jeff. It feels to me like in The Godfather when Salazzo shoots The Godfather six times, he tells Tom Hagen, "The Godfather is slipping." Um, would I have been able to get to him and shoot him six times ten years ago? And I think that's what's happening here with with Star Wars, with Marvel, uh, all under the Disney banner, like, 
they people sense a weakness. Do you think Patty Jenkins would have gone into business for herself if Star Wars and Disney was hardcore like it used to be in the old days where you don't you don't fuck with the mouse? Like I don't think she would have said a word without their approval, but because there's blood in the water, they sense there's a bit of weakness. They can maybe push Iger. She even says in the uh, well, we'll get to that later. But like the Iger situation, a lot of people think because things are in flux that they can push yeah. Iger in one direction or another, and that's what it seems like Patty was maybe trying to do, especially because she used the terms like ownership. We are going to get it to a good place where we are happy with it. And it's like, they I, I'm sure they're just like, just give us the thing so we can give you the check and move on, for God's sakes. I don't imagine they want Patty going out there going like, oh yes, it's, it's very much what I want to put forward and we are going to have to agree before Rogue Squadron comes out. Because I guarantee it's going to go through like 20 more writers before it sees the light of day, if it ever sees the light of day. So... Um, well, let's move on to Gina Carano. Uh, speaking of uh, some situations here, she is Star Wars situation. She gave a lengthy interview to Hollywood Reporter uh, talking about uh, her reaction to being let go in Star Wars. And these are some of the quotes. I'll just read them real quick. I just laid down and cried and cried. I curled into a fetal position. It's not that I didn't think that something like that could happen. It was that I couldn't imagine they would put out this horrendous statement about me after working with me, the most powerful and entertainment company in the world, saying that about me. And then she went on further to talk about how Elon Musk is footing her bill. She claims to have never met him uh, and says that he is fighting, quote, massive injustice battles. Never mind that he just fired Don Lemon um, for asking him uh, questions that hurt his feelings. Uh, she also spoke about the consequences of her firing and says you become unhirable and then it becomes okay for other people to disrespect you. And then you're just carrying around this disrespect and you're shouldering all this shame and it affects your physicality, your ment mentality, you're just kind of hopeless. So to be able to fight back, it makes me feel like, okay, that feels good. And then going on to say that she's not a perfect person, uh, that you'll find a person who is doing her absolute best under one of the most aggressive, unnecessary cancellations in Hollywood history. Uh, and she says, I'm thinking about finally being healthier and having this monkey off my back and telling my story and getting on with my own life. Shannon, just like Patty Jenkins doing a little PR work for herself, this was, I mean, an, for me personally, an opinion, uh, right, uh, an interview that had me guffawing through most of it because it is so transparently a puff piece to try to get her working again in Hollywood uh, that it it's almost comical how what's the word, how ignorant she seems to be about some of the stuff when it's convenient and how very aware of some of the stuff she is when it's convenient. What are your thoughts on the comments here? What are your thoughts on this interview and, and what the reason might be behind it? I mean, anytime someone loses a job like this as a performer who, yeah. you, know, you, you know, you struggle to get hired sometimes, like uh, reading the reaction that she had, I'm like, man, that sucks. Like that, that I feel bad for you. The That's crying, really sad. the fetal position, that stuff? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there, there have been jobs that I've been on hold for that that didn't come through. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, damn, can I just catch a break here? Mm -hmm. um, and, and reading her response to that, I'm like, yeah, I imagine that was heartbreaking. But this is all a monster of your own make. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, Good, when yeah, she talks right. about Favreau bringing her in and she was sort of presuming that she was going to be a Wookiee because up until that point, her Hollywood career outside of Haywire, which her voice was altered for because yeah. she's not a good actress. Yeah. Um, up until then, she'd been kind of a kind of a silent henchman. Like she would have a line here, a line there. You know, she was in Deadpool. She didn't have a ton of dialogue. Um the this opportunity being presented to her where oh i'm one of the people who doesn't i'm not a cgi creation i'm not the voice of a robot or a creature or an alien um i i get to be i get to be me i get to be a version of me and what an incredible opportunity that is and not taking care of it um you know i it's it seemed like disney did try to work with her and Based off of her interview, it didn't sound like they they drew a line in the sand and said, hey, if you do this again, that is it. Yeah. But if you are repeatedly, if, if your boss is repeatedly having you meet with counselors yeah, to yeah. talk about things, it's like, hey, the things that you're doing, maybe don't. Yeah. Or if if you are so steadfast in your beliefs that you're OK with losing that opportunity, go on. But then you don't get to you don't get to cry foul. You don't get to say, yeah. oh, this big company's 
pushing me around. It's like, no, like, I don't know what contract she had signed, but the whole idea of, well, they fired Gina Carano. If she had not signed a contract for Rangers of the New Republic, they didn't fire her. Yeah. Uh, no, <laughs> like there was, they, she, she completed her employment obligations to the second season of The Mandalorian. Yeah. If that contract had not been extended, the whole idea of like, you know, I'm going to, I'm, I'm suing you for wrongful termination is like, you weren't terminated. You just yeah. weren't renewed. And there yeah. is a difference there. I like, they didn't break again. And maybe she did sign a contract. Maybe I'm talking out of my ass right now, but the way that it sounds, yeah. she didn't, there was, there was no contract to continue her employment. So Disney fulfilled their obligations. She fulfilled her obligations. They Disney as a, as a company decided, we don't want to be in business with you anymore. And as a company that practices, <laughs> that is their right. Yeah. So again, part of me feels sympathy for her. The other part is like, this was, you know, you, you are a marginally talented performer mm. who got into this because of your professional sports career. Like mm. that, that is why this happened. And if you <laughs> don't have the goods to keep going, like if she were a tremendous performer, sh she would be doing more. Like someone at this point would have, would have signed her up for something, not including Ben Shapiro's uh, company. Um, but if yeah. she were a tremendous performer, someone would have signed her up. Kevin Spacey is slowly making a comeback. Yeah. And you know that, and that is what happens. And there's a reason that it's not happening with her. It's because she's not that good. Yeah, I mean, Gibson has come back and been Oscar nominated after those voicemails, Mel Gibson. And we've seen that come. I mean, as you said, with Spacey, there's other people who are coming back into um, being accepted back again and doing work and slowly but surely move, them, move themselves away. Michael, this seemed very much like poor me, poor me, poor me, don't blame me. And I was just trying to do this. And I was just trying to say this. And, oh, I didn't know it would mean this. I mean, does someone who is in MMA to claim that they don't understand how a fandom can turn on them. In every sports fucking situation, there are fans who criticize you, ridicule you, laugh at you, go online and do so. So for her to claim like innocence about this, I didn't understand. Even after having spoken with Star Wars actors, it really rings hollow to me. And yeah, at the end of the day, it just feels like this is someone who pissed away a golden opportunity and still does not want to take responsibility for it and still insinuating in all the comments that it's everyone else who misunderstood her, misinterpreted her, and it was unfair. And having Ben Shapiro supporting you and trying to claim like Pedro Pascal's posts were worse uh, is not a good cheerleader to have on your side of these things. Well, what are your thoughts on the interview uh, and how it all came off? I mean, I think they should hire her back. <laughs> <Really? I'm kidding. laughs> I love it. Yes. <clears throat> no, um, I mean, first of all, yeah, like this is we often as as actors and celebrities and directors and uh and people of note do something that puts them on the outs. You you kind of watch this happen, like the slow comeback. Yeah. This definitely was like a oh, that this is what this is. This is this is PR. Yeah. going into overdrive this is like you got a new pr team and the hollywood when they went to the hollywood reporter and he's like like it is very clearly yeah gina's trying to come back but there's a couple things that just really don't add up about it that make it challenging for her to do what she's trying to do one yeah. shannon's right she's suing disney for wrongful termination but i think shannon is correct because the way that disney and lucasfilm phrased it when everything happened was gina carano is not currently employed by right. us right that being said we don't like what she's saying um and i think shannon's right there was clearly talk of her leading a show mm -hmm. um but it doesn't seem like that deal happened and went away maybe it did maybe when all of the lawsuit comes out we're gonna be like nope she signed these papers and then they took it back but I, it kind of feels like disney took the opportunity to be like we have now fulfilled this part of the obligation <laughs> and now we don't want to work with her anymore yeah. and i think the thing that people need to realize is sitting outside of these um walls and looking in and having really just social media and twitter and interviews to kind of go by she you don't actually get fired for a single tweet you don't actually get fired for you said this one thing and right. they're like oh you used the wrong word you're canceled because to kind of to her point there are other people that tweet things or say mm. things in interviews or speak out of turn and 
if those people are generally well liked and people love working with them and they're really or they're really talented or they're really you know or behind the scenes you're like you're actually a great person then people stick up for them i'm going to use yeah. chris pratt as an example chris pratt says shit all the time that yeah. makes everybody go crazy he says something online <laughs> he posts something everybody goes everybody goes batshit crazy that guardians of the galaxy cast has chris pratt's back yeah they always defend him he must be a good guy james gunn who did get fired when all those old school tweets were unearthed when yeah. he got fired the entire guardians cast was like we we're gonna go down with this guy like we love this guy like yeah. we don't want to do anything without him gina carano didn't have that that yeah. kind of speaks for itself um the other part about this whole thing is she's doing this whole poor me i was so confused i yeah. i don't know how this happened to me thing which is a strategy that works it doesn't work as well when you are at the same time suing the company that yeah. you work for right and you're hanging out with elon musk and ben shapiro yeah yeah like that's the thing if your cast if the lucasfilm cast if the mandalorian family of john favreau and filoni and pedro pascal were like guys gina's great and she was hanging with them okay maybe she's going to end up working through this and we're all going to be like okay you did some wrong stuff but when you're hanging out with ben shapiro and elon musk and you're suing disney and you're like i'm so confused poor me you're like no this doesn't add yeah. up this is your your what you are what you are saying in this article and what you are doing in real life and the people you're associating with tell two completely different stories. Yeah, I mean, her it's not like her her posts were anti-Semitic. You know, her posts were racist in ways. Her posts were uh, election-denying bullshit. Like, there was a lot of stuff here. And the fact that as soon as she got fired and she says this interview, or sorry, not fired, as soon as that contract or whatever was terminated, she ran to Ben Shapiro, like literally said, got an RV, and drove to the Daily Wire studios across country to be there. That tells you that this was orchestrated. This was planned. She absolutely knew what the fuck she was doing. She, I think she had already made her decision that she was going to fuck with Disney, get in with the right wing. They would support her because she had seen how all these other people have been canceled, quote unquote, canceled eh, by the left and then found new life on the right. Look, Roseanne Barr is now showing up all over the place on the right wing type of stuff. And so I think she thought, okay, I'll do this. And then Ben Shapiro is going to do this movie and then I'll be a successful actress for right wing movies. The problem is even right wing people like to watch people who can actually act, who actually have talent and they didn't support her shit. And now she's back here, hat in hand, kind of trying to massage the wheels of Hollywood so that they can look at her again for something. But I think Shannon, you said it right. She wasn't that respected of an actress before this happened. She's even less of a respected actress now because who wants to deal with damaged goods that can barely act? It doesn't make sense. But, on, on, so, and no one's going to go watch her films, you know, even putting, even putting aside, I mean, I, I, I don't think you're wrong, but even putting aside the quality of her acting, even sure. putting all of that aside, being like, well, you're a bad actress, so you don't deserve it. Like, even putting all of that aside. I'm not saying don't deserve. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that's why people don't want to work with her. So I'm not saying she don't well, deserve Well, I don't know. There's a lot of people that are bad actors and people like working with them. Like, there, there are people working in this industry. That's true. And they are not great, and they work. So yeah. it's Lindsay's not got strictly speaking that. Week, right? But it is, but I do agree with you that it is It's exactly what you're saying. It's the, I'm coming back hat in hand saying, I'm sorry, I didn't get it, I was confused, I was misunderstood, while I am suing, yeah, and I'm hanging out with two people that are just, um, at this point, very well known and associated with all the things that she says she didn't mean to say. Right. And, she, and who are like, like, it's like it's like I didn't mean this about I didn't mean this about the trans community. I didn't mean this about Black Lives Matter. I didn't mean this about uh, all the things I tweeted. But by the way, both Elon Musk and Ben Shapiro, if you look at anything they say for more than five minutes, agree with all the things that people are mad at me that I tweeted. Yeah, yeah. And also, uh, Elon has an invested in, in interest rather in taking down Disney. And in a, because of what, Disney taking all the advertising down off of X and off of Twitter, which he said in that at that uh, convention a few weeks ago. And so, like, the, in a way, and I do feel bad for Gina in this way, is I feel like she's being used by a number of places for their own purposes. And look, don't 
Gina comes from money. Her family has a lot of money. She's going to be fine. And don't worry about that. It's the other side of it that she's trying to reclaim her name, she says. So yeah, we'll see at the end. What I just think she needs to break off from everything and really kind of do her own thing because it just looks like she's being a pawn in a game between two massive billionaires. And by that, I mean Elon Musk and Disney using her in a way uh, for their own purposes. And that's that's not where you want to be, for God's sakes. Um, all right. And one last thing Let's get for the Disney stuff. Let's get into... Some Bad Batch real quick. We had episodes six and seven from season three that dropped. Um, Michael, I go to you. Uh, your overall thoughts on these two episodes of Bad Batch as we uh, saved Omega uh, from Mount Tantus and had a confrontation at the end between uh, Wolf and Rex there on the mountains. Uh, and uh, they got away. So your thoughts on this overall, these overall two episodes. You know, I was really excited at the beginning of the season. I felt like we kind of got off to a really good start and uh, the pacing was was really kind of picking up. But it does feel to me a little bit uh, that we're sort of settling into what I will just call the typical Bad Batch pace, mm. which is every episode has a, a single reveal. Something happens, but then there's just a lot. And it's beautiful. Like, it's, it's beautifully done. Uh, very, very slow stuff, but it's still very slow stuff. Like for two episodes, like we get to the base with Rex and the clones. We find out that these other clones uh, were being trained in Tantus and that uh, Crosshair was going to be one of them. They all come in. There's a big fight. They leave. The the Bad Batch gets away. Mm -hmm. You're like, okay. Like it, it's like at this point, and, and also it's kind of like what I was saying earlier, in the same way that most of Ahsoka was gosh, we got to figure out a way to get to this planet. How do we get to this planet? We got to get to this planet. And then you get to the end and you're like, okay, so next season, we're stuck on this planet. How are we going to get off this planet? We got to get back out of this planet. We got to go. And you're like, okay, fine. And with Bad Batch, it's a little bit like, okay, we got to get off Mount Tantus. We got to get out of Mount Tantus. Let's get off of Mount Tantus. What do we, okay, we got to get back to Mount Tantus. How do we get back to Mount Tantus? I don't know how to get to back to Mount Tantus. I'm like, all right, like, I guess, but... And, and it's also like you don't ever want to be fully ahead a sh as a show. You don't want to be fully ahead of your audience mm. and watching them all go. What does M count mean? I don't know. Do you know what M count means? Like, I don't know. This is a mystery that we're going to have to solve. And we're like every single person watching is like, we know what M count is. We know why they need it. We know what's going to happen. We've all seen Rise of Skywalker. We know what you're trying to do. This is not a mystery. So I, I still think it's beautiful. I'm watching it till the end. I love the characters. But at this point, I'm getting a little... Uh, this this ties into my Star Wars, what are we doing, where are we going feelings this week. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, and now I know I didn't like the Titanic. We know the ship's going to sink. We know. I understand. I get it. Shannon, your thoughts uh, on these two episodes from Bad Batch Season 3? Accepting these two episodes for what they were, <laughs> I actually quite, I actually quite enjoyed them. Um, I feel like anytime you can put Rex back in with with uh, Clone Force ninety nine, I feel like that's a that's a good dynamic to have. Um, the whole idea that some of the some of the clones aren't prisoners; they're actually being trained. Crosshair was supposed to be one of them. You see that you know they're they're called like the Shadows or whatever. Um, crosshair dealing with his with his trimmers, how he still has a little case of the yips. I mean, I, I thought, again, for these two episodes, I was very, very entertained. Um, as Vogel lays out his litigious arguments, <laughs> kind of like, well, yeah, I mean, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but for the, you know, for the 45 minutes that I spent watching this morning as I was having my breakfast waiting to record with you all, I was like, I, I thought these these were pretty good episodes, um, if not um, not necessarily narratively um, progressive. <laughs> yeah, I like these two episodes. I like the I've been liking the season. This is the Bad Batch season that I've been wanting for three seasons now, and it finally showed up in season three, and I'm enjoying it. I, I'm invested in it. I like it. I don't mind being ahead, Michael. I understand your concerns about. It. I don't mind being ahead because I care about these characters, and I don't actually know what's going to happen to them. Some of them. So I'm like, okay, what is this all leading to? It's kind of like when you watch Rogue One, you're like, are they, for the first time, are they all going to die? What's going to happen? Who's going to live? Who's not going to live? That kind of thing. So I'm still kind of in that place of like, what's going to happen? So as they get the information that I already know, it deepens that concern about what the end result of all of this is going to be. And I like that we got this kind of new, interesting clone soldier that is unkillable, apparently. So what's that? Uh, how's that going to play out over the next few episodes? Um, I like seeing Crosshair and the development of that some more. 
And I enjoyed the end there with Rex and uh, and Wolf, like kind of having this conversation about what he should do. And Rex convinces him to at least let them go and maybe question things. So from and also from a military side that I, I've kind of really been enjoying some of the military aspects of this season and some of the commentary they're making about being soldiers in an army and whether you should follow or not follow orders and question orders yeah. and look to see what more is going on. So I kind of love it from that angle as well when I'm watching it. So for me, I, I'm enjoying the season. And, uh, you know, I totally respect your opinion, Michael, but, I, but I'm enjoying it very much. Look, I'm glad you guys are enjoying it. I'm sorry for you. <laughs> um, but I will say one thing on the front, because I do agree with you. The Rex Wolf conversation at the end was great. And Shannon, yeah. and I agree with you. Anytime I see Rex, I like it. But that's also part of my issue with Bad Batch. Mm. If we're all being really honest, who's more interesting? Rex or Hunter and Wrecker? Rex. Now, Crosshair is great. Don't get me wrong. Crosshair out of most. all of them is the best. Like, because yeah. everything you guys said, all the Crosshair stuff, Crosshair having the yep. yips, Crosshair getting like, Crosshair having been like, on the Empire side, realizing yep. the Empire wasn't there for him, being disillusioned, coming back around, having to sort of like win back people's trust. That's all great. Crosshair, they did a great job with. Yep. But this is the Bad Batch. It's not the Rex show. And the best moment, to John's point, is this wonderful confrontation yeah. between Rex and Wolf, Fair two point. characters that we like for other non-Bad Batch reasons, having this conversation. And it's not Hunter having that conversation. It's not Wrecker having that conversation. It's not Omega having that conversation. It's Rex. And so that's another reason where you're like, okay, but like maybe we just sort of followed Rex and the guys and watched <laughs> them kind of do what they're doing because that seems to be more interesting. I won't deny that Re uh, Hunter becomes the beta once uh, Rex is around. He is definitely the alpha Rex. So, um, all right. Any final words on this? We've spent 40 minutes on Star Wars. We, we got to get to Marvel here. Uh, <laughs> shall we take a break? Let's take a break. All right. We're going to take a break. We'll jump into some Marvel news here on the other side. Thanks so much. We'll be right back right after this. Do, 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 do. It's good. I like that. All right. Let's move on to some Marvel news here. Uh, we got two things to get to that are going on in the world of Marvel. And, of course, the, uh, the one of the big ones here that's been reported from a number of uh, scoopers and sources, Daniel Richtman has uh, reported there. And, he, and, look, a lot of times Daniel writes, sometimes he isn't. Uh, but he is claiming that uh, part of Bob Iger's decision to kind of cut some things down and not take a lot of risks and go with – some well-known properties or well-known uh, quantities that they know they can count on. Uh, they are going, Disney is apparently going to cancel any anticipated Eternals, Ant-Man, and Captain Marvel sequels. Again, this is rumored to be what's happening here. Uh, apparently, Iger, uh, apparently Feige wanted to go forward with an Eternals thing, but, oh, I should put the, the graphic up for you guys. But Iger said no. Uh, so that's the situation there. That That's the rumor. So there'll be no Ant-Man 4, no Captain Marvel 3, no Eternals 2. Uh, and they're focusing on these um, known quantities that they think are going to yield them better results. The fandom has exploded online. Everybody is caught up in their feels about this, specifically <laughs> Eternals 2, specifically Eternals 2. Uh, and now people are like, well, you know, we got to take the risks. So why don't they take the risks with this and risk that? So, gentlemen, do you believe this report? I guess I'll, I'll, um, I'll go to uh, go to you, Shannon, first. Do you believe this report? Do you think this is true? Uh, and um, does this make sense to you? And do you understand the people's anger? I mean, I definitely believe the Eternals 2 thing that, yeah. you know, that movie ended with a lot of threads left hanging. And, and I think you don't do, I don't think you leave as many threads if, if you don't have some idea how, how yeah. they're going to be resolved. That doesn't mean that this is what the next one is going to be and this is what is going to happen. But you, you, you plan on returning to that story in mm -hmm. some capacity. Um, and that's not to say that they won't do it. They're just not going to do it in an Eternals 2. Okay. Um, just right. kind of like with the Incredible oh, Hulk, point. you yeah. know, Iron Man came out the gate, was a huge hit. Incredible Hulk didn't flop. 
Yeah. Incredible Hulk made money, um, but it just was not the runaway hit that they wanted and that they did get with Iron Man. So right, I, right. I think the same thing is kind of true with Eternals. I think I think them headlining another movie seemed like it was probably in doubt, but that doesn't mean that those characters, because there were a million of them, um, that doesn't mean those characters aren't going to appear in the MCU going forward. Some of their roles might de- might be diminished and some of the storylines might not be fully addressed but i don't think it's the last we've seen of the eternals but it doesn't surprise me that um this was they, they took a swing with this and it didn't you know it didn't catch for the most part um like ant-man 4 and captain marvel 3 i kind of doubt those were actually in development because there's mm. so much other stuff that they have to get to first right. um ant-man 4 Never seemed like it was probably going to happen to me that, you know, again, these characters are in the universe. If if, if, uh, Paul Rudd kind of passes the torch to uh, uh, his daughter. uh, Yeah, Cassie Lang Lang and uh, as stature, I could see that happen. Again, I can see those characters sticking around. Captain Marvel 3, after the reception of the Marvels, it was like, yeah, I, I doubt Brie Larson is going to be headlining another Marvel film. Again, I think all three of those characters will return in some capacity. And I think Captain Marvel as a brand, they could return to at some point. Right. It's just not going to be with Brie Larson. But we are getting a Thor five, like even after love and thunder crashed and burned, right? You can understand Ant-Man and Wasp quantum many. Okay. Let's not do a fourth one. Okay. But then you're not going to do a Captain Marvel three. Okay. I get that because of the Marvels and all of that. Eternals 2, I mean, as you said, mo- multiple storylines here. There's a large celestial in the middle of the fucking ocean. So, Girl, don't get me started. <laughs> Michael, your thoughts. <laughs> when you hear this, does this make sense? Do you think this is the smart way going forward? Or is this a bit like, like you said about Star Wars, where they're kind of all over the place and not sure what they want to do? So I think both sides are right. And both mm. sides are wrong. Like really, <laughs> really would have been, like from a strict dollars and cents, Bob Iger trying to write the ship. What have we all been saying for the past year and a half, mm. two years? Mm. Where's Marvel going? What's going on? Who are the Avengers? Where is this team? It's a bunch of characters running around and I don't know who I'm supposed to be rooting for. There's not, who's our core team. Right. So Bob Iger going, guys, let's focus. Let's not make all these movies. Who's the core team? Right. We all know everyone loves Chris Hemsworth as Thor. Thor 4 notwithstanding, we all love Chris Hemsworth as Thor. There's not a single person right. that doesn't scream when they watch Infinity War and Thor and Thor rainbow bridges into Wakanda and says, bring me Thanos, and we all lose our shit. Like, Thor is guaranteed we're all going to get excited, even though we didn't love Thor 4. Yeah. So Bob Iger trying to correct everything and say, let's not do a bunch of stuff. Let's focus. 100% the right move. Yeah. Agreeing with you guys, less about whether the movies did well or not, and more, I think, and this is where I think Bob Iger is wrong about Eternals. And it's not because I like Eternals most out of the three of us, even though I do. But the rumor is that Kevin Feige really wants Eternals too. Yeah. And the reason he does is you have to think of it from a bigger Marvel Universe storytelling standpoint. Okay. And think about where every character is by the end. So, you know, Scott and Cassie and everybody, uh, Janet, like they all got out of the quantum realm. Right. They're in the world. They met a Kang. Scott's a little bit worried about what that might mean. You could leave them alone until you get to Kang Dynasty and Secret Wars and pick up where you left them and they're fine. There's no threads that need to be figured out. Like that's a closed off story. Um, Captain Marvel and Miss Marvel are chilling out. Miss Marvel's putting together the Young Avengers and Monica Rambeau is stuck in another universe with the Mm X-Men. You can leave them there until you get to Kang Dynasty and pick up those threads. Like if you you opened up Kang Dynasty and Captain Marvel was living on the farm and all of a sudden some shit went down and a portal opened and Monica Rambeau came out with fucking Beast and Wolverine and said, we need to talk, we'd be fine. We'd be like, good, I'm caught up. Eternals is a fucking mess in the Marvel Universe if you don't pick up those threads. We all know that that giant fucking celestial in the ocean is going to get picked up in, if not Thunderbolts, Captain America 4. They are going to deal with the celestial in the ocean. We've all heard the rumors. We've all heard the rumors of how it's going to be tied in. 
So that's going to get picked up there. But you have these super powered alien beings mm. that have been living on Earth since the beginning of time. We had a giant celestial show up and abduct one of them. And Harry Styles is running around as Thanos' brother. And, and Kit Harrington has the black sword and maybe Blade was there. Like that is so much that you can't then get to the beginning of Kang Dynasty and be like, by the way, here's the Eternals, here's what happened to Cersei, here's who Eros is, and this is why he's important. And also, here's Kit Harrington, and he's got the black sword, and it's really important. And then, oh, also, like, you just can't do it. So it makes sense that Kevin Feige is like, look, I need to do Eternals too. Like, we need to do it just to, even if we did it to sort of wrap up a bow on this, like, I, I wanna tell that story. Bob Iger's like, Eternals didn't do the box office that we thought it was going to do. And also, Marvel fans are super split on it. And nobody is super engaged with those characters. Audiences outside of super nerds don't really care about them at all. Why don't we focus on the stuff? So Bob Iger's right from a dollars and cents point. But from a bigger, this is how Marvel mm. and the universe works. Kevin Feige has a storytelling mess if he doesn't do a second Eternals movie. Yeah. I mean, I, I take your points. Uh, obviously, both of you. And... Uh, I don't think I think I'm more with Iger. Like I don't think the general public will give a shit. I really don't. I think the nerds who monitor and like me, like us, be the geek buddies nerds who monitor the storylines and put all like they're gonna care. But the general public clearly didn't give a fuck about that movie. Didn't go see it at the numbers that they should. And so I don't think they're gonna care if you cancel all this, uh, the uh, eternal stuff and then weave it in somehow in these other subsequent um, installments, other subsequent films. They'll find a way around it. Whatever. Most of the general public doesn't care because they didn't see the movie. So they're not invested right. in the storylines because they didn't see the movie. So if they didn't see the movie, they don't have that. Well, how does this make sense? How does that make sense? You know, it's only the people who have actually seen the movie and pay super attention, close attention to the Marvel storylines that are going to care about it uh, in the end. So I understand where Iger is coming from. And I, I think it should be. I think they should not do an Eternals 2, should not do. I, don't, I think the Ant-Man thing is unfairly vilified. Uh, again, I think the three of us. We liked Quantumania. We're not going to trumpet it from the mountains, but certainly we thought it was a fine film. It wasn't great, but fine. I mean, and I, I don't think, think it's less offensive than Multiverse of Madness. It's, it's, less offen it's less offensive than Multiverse of Madness. <laughs> yeah, fair than point. Let's fair say point. that. So, I mean, I think it, it deserves another shot because those first two installments were good films. I liked Ant-Man and Ant-Man and the Wasp. I thought those were good films, so one bad film shouldn't kill it. With Captain Marvel, I can understand because the first film was so universally not liked it did make a billion dollars but a lot of people claim it was because of where it was placed the marvels didn't do well and yes i know there are a lot of marvels truthers out there that think it was some vast conspiracy the where marvels everyone was involved to kill the movie instead of accepting that the movie was just not good and i get it you have a right to defend your film you know you could also not tell everyone like i'll never forgive you for not liking the movie come on calm down and don't give me this stuff with disney plus viewing numbers a lot of people stop for accidents. It doesn't mean you want to see one. So these are the things that these are the <laughs> situation I look at when you look at this kind of stuff. God. So at the end of the day, though, I think Disney's making these cuts for what they think is best. But I think playing it safe is how things blow up in your face, especially when things like this. So I may understand what Iger is doing, but I do think it's the wrong move. The things we enjoy about Marvel is they took risks. From Iron Man forward, they took risks in 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 uh, bringing these things about, Guardians of the Galaxy. I bet you every single person would have told you, "Don't fucking do this." No one knows these characters. People barely know these actors. Don't do this. Um, but it worked out, and so you've got to take the risks. Well, if they go back to playing it safe, I think it's eventually going to blow up in their face because it'll it won't be inspiring. It won't be exciting like it was in the past. Yeah, I Michael. agree with that. Okay. But okay. the question would be. Well, yes. you said two different things. Like you were like, I don't think they should do an Eternals two. I don't I get not doing a Captain Marvel three. Yeah. I, okay, you would do. You would give Scott Lang another shot at Batman. I would. Yeah, I, would. I, I don't. I don't think an Ant Man four is a risk. No, I don't say. either. I, you know, so I don't either. when you say, so you say, I don't necessarily agree with Iger, but you do. But what risk? Like, what are the risks you? Let me put it this way: What what risks do you think Marvel should be taking? Explore like what they did with Werewolf, right? The uh, Werewolf by Night or whatever it was. Like, those are the things. Go and explore these characters, or go and find these properties 
that are not that haven't been done but could be rich for storytelling material like they've done that's been their kind of bread and butter as they've gone along with this thing that i've really enjoyed and so to me playing it safe is ant-man 4 i think that's actually playing it safe i don't think that's a risk at all so if you want to go take risks there are characters there are other stories to tell here that you can mess around with and and have fun taking risks with and you could argue well they took risks with bringing in these um uh, these uh, directors bringing in these younger writers it didn't really work out so find that happy medium of taking risks where you where you don't stack the odds against you quite as high like you know what i'm so, saying there's some place in the middle there between playing it safe and taking risks so wherever the middle is i would say that's where marvel needs to be and that's where they've always kind of flourished when they've got it right you know so here's where i think again where i think there's probably mm. like the middle ground is which like you know we read like bob Iger's talking to his investors and says we're not going to take as many risks we're going to stick to things we know people like which is exactly what you should tell your investors and then <laughs> the rumors that's are right. the rumor and if the rumors are true we're all we all get i like i i get why kevin feige wants to do an eternals too i do take yeah. your point i don't think audiences that are outside the geek sphere are going to necessarily miss the eternals if yeah. you know like if like there's other ways to wrap that story so that's fair enough so if those are the movies that Bob Iger is saying we're not moving forward, then I then we're all a little bit in agreement. Mm -hmm. I also agree with you that Marvel should absolutely take risks. But given where they are, and look, and back when Marvel made Guardians of the Galaxy, they had earned the right to take that risk. Yeah, fair point. Yeah, they had been killing it. Avengers, we all you know we the movies have gotten so big that we forget that taking the Hulk. Captain America, yeah, yeah. Thor, and Iron Man, and putting the four of them in one movie at that time, yeah. nobody, like, you're like, is this even going to work? And because of that, they earned the right. Marvel, where they're at right now, you've sort of lost the right to take the big swings in this moment. Now, if I were Kevin Feige, I would go into Bob Iger, and I'd be like, look, I hear you. I get that we're not going to take huge swings in the box office, but I do think that part of what makes Marvel work is that we do take risks. Yeah. So... I will like we're all in agreement that these are the movies that we're going to do for now leading up to Kang Dynasty and Secret Wars on Disney Plus. Can we do Werewolf by Night's a perfect example. Let's do a one shot. Let's do Marvel one shots where we just try and do something super unique and bring some new characters in and we can see which one of those pop. Mm. We can see who get really excited and then we can graduate like there's ways that you can still take risks in a safer, more um, studio friendly way. Mm -hmm. until you've earned the right again and you kind of get back you write the ship and maybe yep. after secret wars and we're all like fuck they did it then they can go and do big risks you know it's like i think there's ways that you can do both yeah fair point michael and uh, shannon any final words on this before we move on to the next topic we, we, yeah we... real quick i was just i was just gonna say that uh uh taking a risk is basically a new character and yep. they will not be able to just use their current catalog of characters over and over and over again. I mean, once they right. finish um, uh, phase six, I mean, granted, you have you have Fantastic Four coming, you have X-Men coming. Um, you 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 could probably just rely on X-Men, um, mm -hmm. but they will introduce more characters. And each one of those characters, if it's unproven, if the, the general public doesn't really know it. I mean, yeah, it's a risk. I mean, you could you could potentially say, I mean, was Black Panther a risk? I mean, you saw the reception yeah. he got in Civil War, so maybe yeah. not. But this was a new character, Captain Marvel. This is our first female-led superhero. Mm. You know, technically that was a risk. It paid yeah. off. Um, the movie was, and, and you know that I, I think that kind of resulted in what you saw, what the sequel did, which was also a movie. Yeah. But they are going to continue taking risks, like with Eternals. Yeah. I mean, outside of the Celestial and the Ocean, I mean, you know, three of them are with that other Celestial. It was yeah. it Kingo, Kingo, Cersei, and Fostos. Uh, if we never see them again, we never see them again. Right. Um, the other three are in space with Harry Styles. We never see them again. We never see them again. Is that the way to wrap th something up nicely? Not really. Um, but at this point, it's like I I could see them being like, ah, eh, okay, you know what? They're gone. We just we just don't ever see them again. Right. Right. Yeah, I could see that happening as well. All right, let's move on to this other section of uh, the show here. Bo DeMaio. Uh, we got to talk about this one. Uh, Bo DeMaio uh, was in the midst of a, uh, a particularly crazy busy time here as the premiere of X-Men 97 happened just a couple of days ago. But a couple of days before the premiere of X-Men 97, Bo DeMaio was sub summarily dismissed from Marvel uh, and dismissed from doing any of the press for this uh, show even walking the press line or walking the red carpet, which is a real, 
real rarity. He wrote seasons one and two, uh, but after he was fired or let go, uh, his email was deactivated. His company email was deactivated. The cast and crew were informed, and then DeMeo's Instagram account, uh, once a source of X-Men updates, was deleted. Um, now, for those who don't know, uh, Bo DeMeo is um, a gay black man, had had an OnlyFans account uh, where he was doing stuff and posting stuff as well. A lot of people felt that this was the reason he got fired, but... Michael, I mean, this is this is uh, you don't do this. So even script writers, screenwriters, rather, who have been replaced or have had their stuff written over again, get to walk the red carpet, get to go to the premiere. This is a massive decision by Marvel, which because they haven't said anything, people are running rampant with the speculation that this is was a homophobic firing, a racist firing. Um, other people speculating that something bigger, like the Jonathan Major stuff, went on behind the scenes. What can you say? What do you know? What are your feelings about this, bro? Well, I mean, it's one of, like, this happened, I mean, when this happens, it's happened, like, when I was at Hasbro, it happened with an executive where, like, one, like, we literally came into the office one day, an office was cleaned out, email was shut down, and nobody talked. And HR was like, <laughs> wow. this person is no longer here, we can't discuss it. And, and it was the same thing internally. You run around and you're like, what the fuck happened? I don't know. <laughs> and, it, and it's like, that's what this sounds like. I mean, like yeah. he was just gone at the worst possible time for them to have him be gone. Yeah. He was gone and everyone was just told nothing Yeah, from what we know, like from what, from what we have heard. Right. <clears throat> and so it, it's, it sounds like it was a, it was bad. Whatever it was, it was bad. Now, as far as all the rumors, I mean, I've I've heard a lot of the rumors. I've been emailing people. I have friends who are friends with Bo DeMaio who knew him before he was working at Marvel who, like, say he's a great guy. But, um, you know, breaking it all down, there, it seems to be a few buckets. Like, there is the bucket of he spoke out of, he, he, he had a lot to say about the writing room on The Witcher. Yes. And some of the writers on The Witcher had a lot of things to say about him. Yeah. And it seems like that was not the most uh friendly. It was a contentious environment. The OnlyFans thing I don't think is it is is what it is because A, it was a non-explicit OnlyFans account. Right. He didn't right. post anything explicit there. And he's openly had that for a long time. There are interviews right. dating back to last year where he was openly talking about his OnlyFans account and what went on. So it's like it's not like that was an earth shattering piece of news that came out this past week. Right. Like they've that's been known. He has been very openly gay. He has been very openly posting sexy pictures of himself on Twitter and Instagram. Um, he's very openly proud of being a gay black man. So mm -hmm. those are all things I've heard. I've heard rumors of things that he said that are derogatory about other writers. I've heard rumors about things that he said that are derogatory about other people in the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. But again, none of those seem to rise to the level. So it's all just hearsay and rumors. Um, Whatever it was, I don't know that we're going to find out, but I guess what I'm saying is all the rumors that I've heard thus far, as much as like this sounds juicy or that sounds juicy, it's all stuff that's been around. Yeah. Like none of this is new information. It's stuff that Marvel would have known about and has been covering. Um, the, other, the only thing that's X-Men specific, it seems, is that he did get into a lot of um, arguments online about the casting of Sunspot. Mm-hmm. That that the he has, uh, yeah. I, I believe, a lighter skin Brazilian actor as yeah. Sunspot, and not sort of an Afro Brazilian person. And a lot of people got mad at him about that, and there was a lot of contention. But again, that was a while ago. Yeah, yeah. So I think, without knowing any specifics, this does fall into that category, just based on some of the rumors of him with other writers, of like what we were talking about with Gina Carano. Mm. It's it's that it's that thing of if you're a really great person and people behind the scenes really like you mm. and something comes up or something happens, there's usually going to be people that got your back. Yeah. And yeah. right now, both the silence of a lot of people combined with a lot of people coming out saying, well, he said this on the Witcher, he did this. Like, it just seems like there's not a lot of people who have his back and that is telling. Mm. Okay. Shannon, your analysis of this, situation your reaction then your analysis of what you think might have happened here i mean it's pretty unprecedented and mm -hmm. again like having seen him at comic-con um at, right. at the marvel animation panel i mean this was a guy who ostensibly loved these characters and loved yeah. this show and it was really kind of a formative experience for him as as a young comics fan um 
so listening to him talk, like it was, it was awesome. Cause you know, you, you love to hear people talk about what they love to do. Yeah. And it's like, Oh, this seems like such a great marriage of, you know, this, this is someone who's a true fan wants to continue the story and who's also, um, you know, got chops and, you know, good writer. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it seems like Marvel, uh, whatever happened, like something, something happened. Yeah. It seems, um, that they are going to be in the wake of the Jonathan majors thing. Um, they're going to be quitty pretty quick to, cut ties with anything they view as problematic. Yeah. So again, I, I think the stuff that Vogel mentioned, how it was already kind of out there, um, that that maybe that was just like a, a snowball that just kept forming as it was rolling down the hill, or maybe there was something that happened that was just too big to ignore. And they're like, all right, no more. Yeah. Um, but my guess is that, yeah, we probably will never find out what the actual story is. My guess is he probably had to sign an NDA uh, to, to, uh, uh, conclude his time at Marvel. Um, but yeah, I mean, everyone that talks about the show who, who went to that premiere said it's, if you're a fan of, you know, the nineties X-Men series that you're going to be really happy. So, you know, to, to cut someone loose who did a good job, like, again, something had to have happened. Yeah. I, really I think that's where hope, it is. Go, I really yeah, do ahead. hope that it doesn't get like, and I don't think it will, because I think again, in the world of, in the Twitter sphere, everyone is like, Oh, Bo DeMaio, what happened? What happened? What happened? Outside of the Twitter sphere, people are like, Oh, there's a new X-Men show. Cool. Um, so I think, <laughs> that, uh, so I, I hope that this doesn't, um, hurt the reception of the show next week because mm -hmm. yeah, like, like Shannon said, everything I'm hearing from people who went to the premiere, like it's awesome. The yeah. clip that was released this week, showing them fighting the Sentinels, like that it looks awesome. great. It yeah. looks super fun. So I'm still really excited for the show. And it does seem like, again, to Shannon's point, and, and I think Brad, Brad Wonderbomb came out uh, like this yep. morning maybe. And yep. his yes, statement man. was that like Bo DeMaio did a great job on seasons one and two. Yep. We're really excited about it. So like, I, I, I am excited about the show um, to see where it goes. And I'm curious. I mean, I do think that I would put my money on um, someone has a temper and is argumentative as mm -hmm. the most likely culprit somewhere in there. Um, but we might never know. Yeah, I agree. I think it's it has to be something big, especially on the Jonathan Ma and the heels of the Jonathan Major stuff. Uh, and I get some people who are saying, "Look, why are they canceling these these movies that had diverse leads, and now they go after a black gay creator?" And Mar what is Marvel doing? And I think people need to calm down and look at these situations specifically. And you all know I'm the first one to uh, to grab the drum and think it's you know racism or whatever. So what? if I'm <laughs> Yeah. So if I'm telling you to calm down, I think you guys need to calm down and reassess these situations individually, wait for more information to come out and also be realistic about this situation. How many companies are going to go through, throw good money after bad. You got to look at these situations. And then with Bo DeMaio, you got to wait and see what comes out on it and uh, be a little more open-minded. Uh, we got to wrap up here in five minutes. So uh, real quick, there are speculate, there is speculation out there with the Marvel stuff. Henry Cavill and Ryan Gosling have both supposedly, that's the rumor, accepted roles in the MCU. Shannon, I go to you first. Who would you like to see Cavill playing? Who would you like to see Gosling playing? The rumors are Nova and Dr. Doom for Gosling and Wolverine and Dr. Doom for cavill or what do you think uh gosling's awesome um nova seems like it would be a good fit i don't i don't see a dr doom from gosling um mm. also gosling has said in the past he wants to play johnny blaze um and i could definitely see gosling as more of a oh. ghost rider type type role or type yeah. character um Cavill, uh, it really depends on who's directing him. Like, I, I I think if Guy Ritchie is directing Henry Cavill, he will turn in a great performance. I think mm -hmm. even though The Man from Uncle did not do well, um, Henry Cavill in that film is fantastic. Agreed. Um, with the wrong director, Cavill can be very wooden and very boring, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Um, So I, I, I don't know if Matt Shackman is the guy to make him an interesting doom. Um, and again, I just don't see him. I just don't see him as a doom. I, I mean, they talked about Captain Britain for years um, mm. and Wolverine. Eh, no. <laughs> Watching. And again, I didn't watch a ton of The Witcher, so maybe he grew yeah. in the role. But him trying to be uh, trying to menacing just came off a little silly to me, despite the mm. fact that the dude is shredded and can probably snap me in half. Um, I just don't, he's just not Logan to me. So, okay. but, but Gosling, I would love to see in the MCU in some capacity. All right, Mike, your quick thoughts. 
I'm just picture. I'm just thinking about Tom Cruise as Iron Man in Multiverse of Madness, and I feel like we're back where we started. <laughs> <laughs> like I don't like all these rumors flying, and I'm like, how much of these are real rumors, and how much of this is somebody on Twitter said something, and it's just gone like a, it's gone like wildfire. Like, mm. and, and I think part of it is because I'm kind of with Shannon, like. Given the names that are out there, like, look, I love Ryan Gosling. I think he can do anything as far as yeah. I'm concerned. And Henry Cavill, I think is kind of boring. But um, but I get that he's big and fans love him and whatever. But both of them just don't quite seem like the fit. Okay. Um, you you just given the way, I mean, like, Pedro Pascal getting cast as Reed Richards. I mean, the, he's a big name and he's a very, very popular name. But even he sort of has that melts into the role that he plays. Mm -hmm. Whereas Henry Cavill and Ryan Gosling are just so big. Yeah. And Marvel tends to cast like a little bit below that so that someone can come in and really embody that role. It yeah. feels like, and I, they just see, it just, it, it, it really strikes me as the Tom Cruise is showing up as Iron Man, as Tony Stark. You guys wait and see, I can't wait to see it. And then everybody went to see Multiverse of Madness. was like, I liked it, but where was Tom Cruise? I thought he was going to be in the movie. I'm like, yeah, okay, we'll see. I'll believe <laughs> Would it you I say Pedro Pascal has an elasticity to his performance? <sighs> Here I come. Oh, here I come. Oh. <laughs> um, here's what I'll say. I want Cavill as Doom. I don't want Gosling in the MCU. I would love Gosling as Booster Gold. That's, I mean, that to me is just, that is just fucking perfect casting. Do a Booster Gold movie. Have Ryan Gosling lead it. If you want to really fulfill my fantasies, bring back Russell Crowe as an old Ted Cord with Gosling's young Booster Gold. And you may not get the Nice Guys remake, but you get that chemistry in DC. And since you're going to stay with the Blue Beetle you have now, an old Russell Crowe Ted Cord who's been out in the fucking jungles, I think that would be awesome. So I just put it out there. That's a grumpy uh, Ted Cord. <laughs> Cool. By the way, uh, I would watch the shit out of that movie. I'm not going to lie. Susan Sarandon I'm is sold. age specific to be a I sister. Am, that works. I'm sold on, I mean, I'm, I'm mostly sold on Ryan Gosling as Booster Gold. I do agree with you that out of everything in the world, the I, like the idea of Ryan Gosling as Dr. Doom is like a, an, an interesting choice. I don't sure. think it's the right one. The idea of Ryan Gosling as Nova, it's like, I could see it. The idea of Ryan Gosling as Booster Gold over in the DC universe is just a home run. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Well, there you go. That's our Geek Buddies episode for today. Thank you all so much for joining us. Sorry we went a little bit over an hour, but we hope we entertained you throughout the whole hour and 10 minutes so far of this uh, particular episode. We appreciate you all hanging out with us. Shannon, what do we have to tell them? Yeah, I'd like to follow us on social media. On Twitter, it's at geek underscore buddies. On Instagram, at the underscore geek underscore buddies. If you'd like to follow me on social media, on Twitter, it's at Shannon underscore McClung. On Instagram, at Shannon the Geek Buddy. If you would like to follow Mr. Vogel, it is at MK Tune. If you would like to follow Mr. Roca, it is at The Roca Says. Mikey. After you do all that following, you can also hit that like button below. Subscribe to Johnny's Outlaw Nation page. Check out all the Please. amazing content he has got there. Leave your comments below. A lot of Star Wars talk. A <laughs> lot of Marvel talk. A lot of opinions flying around. We know you got them. Let us know below in the chat uh, or in the comments. If you're listening to us <laughs> on a podcast, go ahead and leave us some stars and some comments so we go up in the rankings. And as always, the best thing you can do is retweet this video, post it on your social, send it to your friends, and tell them to hang out with your buddies, the geek buddies. <laughs> Star Wars, Marvel, a lot happening. My IC Oppenheimer. All right, thank you all so much. <laughs> we love you madly. Have a great weekend, and we'll talk to you next time with another brand new episode here of The Geek. Buddies! <gasps> 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 <gasps>